Hey everybody, welcome to Local Business Hacks Podcast. I'm your host, Carl Case, and I'm on a mission to help you. Every week we're gonna be talking to local business owners and experts to get their best tips, tricks, and hacks to grow your business. This show's designed to teach you, inspire you, and motivate you to take massive action and start to build your future-proof business. Whether you're just starting off or you're taking your existing business to the next level, this episode is for you. So let's get started. Hey, local business hackers. I'm your host, Carl Case, head of business development at Referizer, joined today by Gordon Logan, founder of Sports Clips. Gordon, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Carl. It's great to be here. Looking forward to it. Thanks. So you have quite an interesting story. I'd love for you to talk about how you went from recycling old newspapers to founding the largest <laughs> hair salon in the world. You did do some research. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I've had an entrepreneurial uh, bent from, from a young age. Uh, what Carl's referring to is what, back when I was probably about eight years old, I would ride around the neighborhood and ask the neighbors to save their newspapers for me. And every Saturday morning, I'd go around and collect their newspapers and also the coat hangers. I recycled those as well. I was one of the original recyclers. Uh, and um, back then, moving companies would use newspapers to pack goods when, for moves. And I would roll those up in 25 pound rolls and my mom would take me down to the moving company and I'd sell them for a penny a pound, take the coat hangers over to the dry cleaners and cash those in. And that's how I got my spending money. That's awesome. Took my version of washing cars at the age of eight to a whole nother level. <laughs> it's amazing. So I can imagine that everyone on this podcast has heard or seen a sports clips, but for those people that haven't, Talk to me a little bit about how Sports Clips has positioned itself as the largest men's hair salon in the world, and how can people that haven't experienced it try it for themselves? Well, I've been in this industry for <clears throat> over 40 years, and for the first uh, 10, 15 years, I was in the full service end of the business, and in the early 90s, I realized nobody was paying any attention to the men and boys market. The barbershops were going away. Barber schools were going away. And men were being forced to go to family haircutters or, or uh, salons. It was very common to see signs in the window, beauty salons back in those days that say men welcome or unisex. And even though we may have been welcome, we weren't necessarily all that comfortable there. So we thought if we created a concept that was targeted specifically towards men and boys and trained our hairstylists to execute men and boys haircuts, there was an opportunity there as a niche that no one was serving. And there were a lot of established haircut franchises out there and chains. And we kind of liked the idea of being in, in a part of the industry that nobody else was paying any attention to. So here we are 30 years later. This is our 30th uh, anniversary year. We have about 1,900 locations in all 50 states and five provinces in Canada. So long story short, it's not the barbershop on the corner anymore. Now it's the barbershop on the corner of every corner. Well, it's a lot more than a barbershop, nothing against barbershops, but it's a, really a great experience. And um, it, it, we talk a lot about the experience because typically men don't look forward to getting a haircut. It's just something you have to do every, every three or four weeks. So like going to the dentist, uh, you, you know you're supposed to, but you're not necessarily looking forward to it. So we wanted to make it as enjoyable as possible. And so from the first time you walk in the door, look around, see the ambiance, the environment, the TVs playing sports and so forth. And you, you say, I feel comfortable here. This is my kind of place. Everything from the greeting when you walk through the door, the consultation, the uh, haircuts, our stylists are trained specifically to do, execute men and boys haircuts. Our shampoo bowls are not your traditional shampoo bowls. They're what we call a European style. The stylist stands behind and can really execute a very, very nice massage of shampoo. Shampoo chairs are heated, which is not so uh, important in some parts of the country, but in other parts, it comes in pretty nice at this time of year. And then massaging. So a hot towel on the face, massaging shampoo on a massaging heated chair. It's a very, very nice experience. And then we top it off with a neck and shoulder massage after the haircut. So it really is much more than just a haircut. I, I agree. And Sports Clips does offer a myriad of different services, not necessarily that everybody has to get that. I know my first time going to Sports Clips, I, I accepted the complimentary upgrade to try it. And I was hooked ever since because how could you not want to get a hot towel and get massaged while you're getting a haircut? It's, you know, it's, it's a win, win, win. 
Well, the complimentary upgrade that first time gets a lot of people to expose to something they've never experienced before. So that's a really our signature service and really sets us apart from the other competitors out there. I agree as a customer myself, for sure. Um, so Gordon, you know, sports clips originally, I, I, like, like you said, I, I definitely did my research, you know, franchising from what I've, I've seen that you've done in the past ultimately affected you because you were able to really affect a lot of people's lives in, in a mass quantity. Correct me if I'm wrong. And I can imagine that you've had some incredible stories that have really touched you when it comes to awarding a franchise to someone and then checking in with them a little bit after. Do you mind sharing some of those emotional stories that, that you've been able to witness throughout this journey? Well, I've been in franchising my whole career in the beauty industry. I uh, started out as a franchisee of a system called Command Performance that was pretty hot back in the late 70s, early 80s, and unfortunately went Chapter 11, and then it got bought and sold a few times. And another franchisee, and I, I wound up buying that. So I'm very comfortable with franchising as a concept. And one of my favorite, I guess you'd call it a philosopher or a motivational speaker, is Zig Ziglar. And Zig had, had a saying that says, you can have anything you want in life if you help other people get what they want. And to me, that's what franchising is all about. If we can have uh, successful franchisees that have realized in their dreams and, and goals and financial security and time with their family and so forth, then we'll be successful also. And that's the kind of the philosophy we built Sport Clips on from day one. Having been a franchisee before, I'm very sensitive to the other side of the table, so to speak, understand the franchisee's concerns. We operate Sport Clips stores ourselves. We believe in our product. We have 73 locations in five different states, One, two, three, four, four, four states, excuse me. And uh, we have some of the most successful stores in, in our, our system because we feel like we have an obligation to demonstrate that the systems and techniques that we've developed over the last 30 years are successful and will work if you apply the system, work the system. So we, uh, we don't sell products to our franchisees. I've seen that create all kinds of problems uh, in other franchises. We don't compete in markets where there are other franchisees. So we don't want to be in competition with, with them for real estate or for stylists. And we run our business on a philosophy that was very well stated by Coach Lou Holtz when he was a head coach at Notre Dame. And he made a videotape program called Do Right. That's about how he took kids from all over the different parts of the country, different backgrounds, and melded them into national championship teams. And his philosophy, is his value system is, is meshed so perfectly with ours that I wrote Coach Holtz and asked his permission to use his material in our system, and he graciously gave that to us. And our what we call heart of a champion is, is it's very simple, straightforward. It's to do what's right, do your best, and treat people the way they want to be treated. And that's, that's not only a, the right way to do business, but I think it's a smart way to do business. I love that. Yeah. Always be proud of your decisions for sure. So Gordon, do you mind sharing some examples of franchisees that you awarded a franchise to that it really changed and molded their lives? Well, we've got quite a few examples of, of that. Uh, the, the, we have franchisees with 60 or 70 locations now. Wow. Um, they started out with one or two or three and, and grew over time. It's not unusual when we have our meetings to have franchisees come up to me and say, thank you. You know, you're you really made a huge difference in our life. I can have control over my own destiny. I can spend time with my kids. I don't miss Little League games anymore. Uh, I'm not traveling all the time. So it's, it's been very, very rewarding. We have a, about 100 of our franchisees have 10 or more stores. So there's, there's some real success stories out there. And uh, I, I love it. You know, I, I, I'm very happy for them. And and that's, like I said, if they're successful, we're successful. So uh, we've got lots and lots of stories. So I've got one of my greatest success stories, not my greatest, but a great success story, is a lady who started working for us before Sport Clips even in our salon. She was an Iranian refugee and could barely speak English. But she had a tremendous work ethic. And she worked for us and for several years became a manager. And when we started Sport Clips, she managed a very successful store here in, in, uh, in, in Austin. And then she got married to a really terrific guy, but they moved to Tucson. And so <laughs> it 
as a wedding present. We gave them some franchise agreements to get started down there. And they have 10 locations now. They have the whole market for Tucson. And she is just a superstar. And I'm seeing that coming here with nothing and working hard for all those years and uh, realizing the American success story, that's been a, one of my favorite stories. I love that. And congratulations to your Tucson franchisee for staying with you this whole time. Uh, she's terrific. Yeah. That's awesome. So, Gordon, you and your son have an interesting dynamic as I have in my life. My father is one of my number one supporters and is at every trade show with me and working working right by my side. Your son is the CEO of Sports Clips. How does that play in regards to your relationship with him? And let's speak a little bit on that topic. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, he has been interested in the business since he was a little fellow. And back then I had my office in my home. And sometimes he'd pick up the phone and answer just like he was an official thing. And, Hello, command performance. How am I help you? <laughs> when he was like four years old. <laughs> um, and uh, when he was in junior high and high school, uh, after school, he'd come in and help out at the office. And then when he went off to college, I had trained him on how to review blueprints and store plans. We review all of our store plans, make sure there's consistency. So I gave him $100 for every set of blueprints that he reviewed. And it was a good deal for us. And it was a good deal for him. Gave him some spending money while he was going to college. And we agreed that after he graduated, he would work somewhere else for a few years. So he did. And we went with Deloitte Consulting for a couple of years. Came back to us in 2010, started out operating one store and then three and six and eventually took over all of our company on operations back then, which were 14, I think we had at that time. And uh, he worked his way up. He became uh, vice president of operations after a few years and chief operating officer and president and was promoted to a CEO about three years ago. So it's been a great process. I feel very fortunate to have a, a son who's very interested in the, in the business and always has been and does a great job for us. And we have a good working relationship. I like to stay in the background now and let him take care of the day-to-days and um, take the lead on things. But I, I am still engaged in the business and I like to be supportive however I can to make sure that he's successful and our whole system is successful. That's awesome. And I'm glad that it's staying in the family. Well, I I know a lot of people who have businesses and their kids just aren't interested at all. And I feel very fortunate that he has been and is interested and we are privately owned and we plan to stay that way. Amazing. Gordon, if we can dig a little deeper into the father-son relationship, I'm personally really curious and I can imagine our listeners are too. How did your dynamic change when your son was working at Deloitte Versus coming into sports clips and starting off, not necessarily at the bottom, as a normal Joe and now being CEO, how have you seen the dynamic between the two of you change, your conversations, whatever that may be? Well, if you think back when you were in your early 20s and then as you as you matured into your 30s, your relationships change regardless of whether you're working in slave business or not. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we have a very healthy relationship. We enjoy bouncing ideas off each other. It uh, it was, I, I told him when he came on board, I said, people are going to be watching you and people are going to be looking to see if you are where you are just because you're our son and you have to prove yourself and get credibility, not only among the people on our corporate team, but also our franchisees. And so he took what was really a well-performing, but not outstanding performing company store operation and turned it into one of the best operations in the whole system. So it makes it a lot easier for us to implement new ideas and so forth. When we can tell our franchisees, here's what we did, here's what it cost, and these are the results. This is a return on investment. So it's a whole lot easier and better to demonstrate success and and rather than saying the franchise agreement says you got to do such and such. So that's been a real plus, and he has stepped up to the plate, and he's he's done everything he's he needed to do all the way along the line to establish his credibility and help a lot of people be successful, and, and by, in turn, being successful himself. I love that. So long story short, he earned his street cred pretty early on in, in the sports clips yeah, world. That's really, really important for him, especially being the boss's son. I think yeah. he, any kid going into uh, in, into their family business is going to be faced with that. You know, you really have to 
uh, on your P's and Q's and, and, and improve yourself so that it's not just a, a gift. I love that and definitely can appreciate it and understand where that comes from. So, Gordon, my last question for you before we wrap up, you've touched thousands of people all over the globe with sports clips and what you got, what you've been doing. What would you say is the number one piece of advice that you would give to somebody that is thinking about leaving corporate America or leaving their retail job and and going off on their own and starting their own business? You mean other than buying a uh, sport clips franchise? <laughs> Uh, all kidding aside, franchising is a great way to get into business because uh, you really have the support systems around you. A lot of people coming out of corporate America, they've had marketing departments and human relations departments and, and finance departments and so forth. And when you go out on your own, you are the business. You're the chief cook and bottle washer. <laughs> and without that support system in there, it's overwhelming. I have a lot of respect for people to go out and start their own business, especially in today's world, because that's a lot more complicated to start a business today than it was 20, 30 years ago. But franchising, we have made a lot of mistakes. But one of the things that that we strive to do is to establish the system so our franchisees don't make the same mistakes we make. And that's why we operate stores. Every Every new bright idea we have, we test in our own stores first. We prove it in our own stores, and then we have some key larger franchisees that we ask to test it. So it's thoroughly tested before we roll it out. Marketing systems, recruiting programs, technology, the whole nine yards. And so that's not to say that every franchise is perfect for everyone. There's 3,500 franchises out there, so they're all coming in all shapes, sizes, and some are really great and some are not so great. But that's something I think everybody ought at least consider is to look at franchising as a concept. But being in business for yourself, regardless of whether you're independent or whether you're in a franchise, there are going to be bumps in the road. Uh, Plans are great, but plans rarely work out just the way you thought they were. In fact, General Eisenhower during World War II, he said, plans are worthless, but planning is essential. Because you have to know what your goals are and the direction you're going, and you can make adjustments as you go as things come up. But be prepared. There, there will be obstacles that come up that you don't anticipate, sometimes totally beyond your control. Jim Collins has written some great management books. My favorite is Great by Choice. But he, he talks in there about return on luck, because whether it's an economic crisis or COVID or whatever it happens to be, it happens to everybody. And some people will come through very, very strong, and other people will roll over. And the difference is how they approached it. And every challenge, every crisis, there are opportunities. Some people will adapt and take advantage of that, increase market share and so forth, and others will just essentially give up or roll over. So be prepared for adversity. Make sure you're well-financed. You're running out of money before your concept grows to fruition is a danger that happens to a lot of startups. And that's a terrible thing when you were just so close, another three months, six months, 12 months, and you would be over the hump. And we went through that process too. There were some times I had to scratch my head and figure out how I was going to make payroll or pay the rent. Um, And luckily we came through that, but have a cushion. Don't just have an optimistic plan, have a realistic plan and maybe a worst case plan. What happens if If things don't work out, what am I going to do? How am I going to recover from that? So you have to stay alive to be successful. Again, Collins talks about if you have a bright idea, shoot bullets before you fire cannonballs. So rather than putting all your eggs in one basket and and betting and farm on on something you think is going to work, try it, test it. And, And once it's tested and proven, then you can put your full resources behind it and make it work. And that's what oftentimes it takes. So there's, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of lessons to be learned and, you know, there's a lot of great books have been written. I think Collins has written some of the best, but uh, it's, it's a perseverance. Another thing, don't give up. You know, as Winston Churchill said, never, 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 never give up. Uh, just as you know, they say, they, it's the darkest before the dawn. And too often people do give up just you know, right before they're on the cusp of success and It's sad to see that happen. So be prepared. Like I say, don't just have a rosy scenario and assume everything's going to be coming up perfect. It's not. But if you have a good idea and you're willing to work it hard, 
it will pay off in the long run. Amazing advice. And it ultimately comes down to remember why you became an entrepreneur in the first place. Yeah. Because you, know, you uh, believe yeah, the definition of an entrepreneur is, is someone who do almost anything to keep from having a real job. <laughs> That's a good one. I have a t-shirt that says entrepreneur definition, guy who jumps off a cliff and figures out how to build an airplane on the way down. <laughs> That's a little drastic, but <laughs> <laughs> good luck on the uh, construction project. <laughs> Thanks, man. Gordon, I want to thank you for myself, my family, and everybody over at Referizer, in addition to our listeners all over the globe for getting on our platform, sharing your story, and and being an amazing pioneer that people can look up to in this space and in the franchising world in general. Well, it's my pleasure. And like I say, it's always great to see people take a dream and make it happen. So it's been my honor to have the opportunity to do that on, on a number of occasions, and I look forward to doing many more. Thanks, Gordon. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, Carl. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. That's it for this week's episode. I hope you found it helpful. Be sure to head over to our site, local-business-hacks.com to check out the show notes and send me questions or ideas for future episodes. If you want to grow your business, just like the people you've heard from here, follow Local Business Hacks podcast and tune in for new tips, tricks, and tactics. Until next time, thanks for listening and keep hacking.